Uh, but today, uh, I really want to, I want to preach a word to you uh, that I hope that would encourage you and to push you forward. Um, at the beginning in January of this year, uh, I, when I came a couple of months ago and I preached to you, I, I let you know that there was, a, there was a man of God that said in January during our prayer, time of prayer and fasting, uh, back when I was in Pittsburgh, that uh, he said, this is the year of breakthroughs and turnarounds for not only for you, but for our nation. And as we began to pray, as we began to press into what God had for us, we began to see that happen in our nation. Things that we thought would never change, changed. Things we thought that would never stop, stopped. And we're believing even now that the next months of your life, that God would do a breakthrough for you. Because like I said last a couple of Sundays, and I'm going to keep saying it till the day I die, that God can do anything about your situation. God can do anything about your need. God can do anything when me and you put our faith in him. Amen. God can do anything. That daughter of mine is, is, a, is a perfect example of what God can do. When, God, when the doctor said I couldn't have kids, there she is right there. There she is. There's my beautiful daughter. She's watching online, by the way. So I love you. I love you, Nikki. And um, so that is a testament of what God can do. When I choose to put my faith in him, when I choose to put it, not on what I'm feeling, not when I watch on the news, not because someone else said something and gave their opinion. No, no, no. I choose to trust God. I choose to. So if you're taking notes, the title of a message is simply this, a turnaround faith. A, a, a turnaround faith. A faith that doesn't just uh, get you to to, to turn around in your life, but it's also faith that gets Jesus to turn around to you. It gets Jesus' attention. Because when we get to a faith that gets Jesus' attention, Jesus will respond to that. He'll respond to that prayer. He'll respond to your belief. That's why Pastor Alex said, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. And I don't know what you came, what kind of mountain you got today, but today is the day that God wants to move that mountain in your life. Today is the day that whatever struggle has been happening, happening in your life, God wants to take that away and move it from your life. But your faith has to come first. Has to come first. It's a turnaround faith. It's a faith that makes Jesus notice. And when Jesus notices, he'll also turn around your life for the better. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go with me uh, to the book of Luke chapter 7. We're going to be in verses 1 through 10. Luke 7, 1 through 10. We're going to be in several different verses today, but I'm going to, this is the big one. It says this. It says, when Jesus had finished saying all this to the people, he returned to Capernaum. At the time, the highly valued slave of a Roman officer was sick and near death. When the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respected Jewish elders to ask him to come and heal his slave. So they earnestly begged Jesus to help the man. If anyone deserves your help, he does, they said, for he loves the Jewish people and even built a synagogue for us. So Jesus went with them. But just before they arrived at the house, the officer sent some friends to say, Lord, don't trouble yourself by coming to my home, for I am not worthy of such an honor. I'm not even worthy to come and meet you. Just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say, go when they go or come and they come. And if they say to my slaves, do this, they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. Turning to the crowd that was following him, he said, I tell you, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. And when the officer's friends returned to the house, they found the slave completely healed, completely healed. I, I want to talk about this subject. Maybe you grew up in church and you've probably heard this passage a lot in your life, or maybe you're new and you're here for the first time. And this is the very first time you've ever heard this. This is such a big moment in the gospels. And if we're not careful, we'll miss the moment. This is, this is a moment where Jesus is encountering a centurion officer. You have to understand the Romans cared, cared nothing for the Jewish people. They cared nothing for God. If you ever study Roman history, you know that God is not in the picture. 
You know that God has nothing to do with these people. They care nothing about God. They have their own gods. They live sexually immoral lives. They just had a different lifestyle. But this centurion hears about Jesus and says, you know what? I have a servant that I love a lot. And man, if no one else, if these gods that we worship can't do it, this man has to do it. This man has to do it. The centurion, you have to understand, the centurion officer was a man with position. He was a man that if in, in his day, when his, his position specifically, was he oversaw over 100 soldiers. Let's say there was a, uh, an army of 6,000. There were officers that, would, that were divided that would see, oversee 100 men. So this man had a reputation. This man was a Roman officer. But he also understood who God is. And what God can do for his servant's life. The Bible says in, in 7 verse 1 that, that as Jesus was coming to Capernaum, the, the officer, you know, he had a slick slave. But it says that when the officer heard about Jesus, he sent some respective elders to ask him to come and heal his slave. When he heard about Jesus... It's very easy for me and you to come Sunday in, Sunday out, and hear about Jesus, yet nothing change. It's easy for me and you to show up this morning, lift up our hands, and clap our hands and yell for God, yet leave the same. And come Monday, you got the same situation. Come Tuesday, you're still dealing with the same addiction. Come Friday, and you're still going with the same friends. Everything, it's come, it becomes a routine. But here's the thing we have to get to understand, church, and we can learn from this Roman officer, is that when we learn to hear the word of God, it should put on us to respond. It should make us, we have to learn to respond to what we hear. The word, the word of God is, 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 is something that is alive and active, and it requires us to respond. It requires us to respond to his word. There's a difference when I'm just hearing something and when I'm listening. There's moments where I could hear you, I can hear what you're saying. I can hear your complaint. But if I'm not listening, I'm not going to do anything about it. If I'm not listening, it's not really going to change my life. It's kind of like when your teacher is trying to teach you something and you're hearing them, but you're not listening. Because listening goes down into your brain, into your spirit. And then you learn the subject. Teacher, I'm trying to help you today. All right. You should be saying amen. All right. Because you know that sometimes your kids are looking at you, but their mind is somewhere else. I had a teacher that would always say, you're in la-la land. I, I was like, that's like the f every teacher uses the same famous word, la-la land. You're in la-la land. That was me. I was in la-la land. But the centurion, the Bible says that the centurion heard. He heard about Jesus. And he wasn't just hearing. You could tell that he was paying attention. He was hearing, oh man, there's this man named Jesus that's going around healing other people. He's going around and, he, and he's touching people and they're being healed. He's going around, he's teaching and there's, there's, the food is being multiplied and there's things that are happening. Church, you have to understand something. That faith in Christ isn't going to change your life until what you hear leads to what you do. Faith in Christ isn't going to change your life until what you hear leads to what you do. What you listen to leads to what you do. Because we have to understand, church, this morning, that me and you, we're in a different kingdom. We serve a different kingdom. We have a different God. We have a different life. And my question to you is, what are you hearing? What are you hearing? What are you hearing throughout the week? Is what you're hearing affecting to what you're listening to in God? Is what you're hearing negativity, and what are you allowing in your life? If the news is your biggest voice, you have to re-evaluate your life. If, if other people's opinions are the biggest voices in your life, then you have to reevaluate, man, what am I hearing? Because can I tell you something? It can get very easy to listen to the sounds and the noise of everybody else and miss out on what God's trying to do in your life. It can be very easy to hear other people, hear social media, hear conversations. It can be very easy to hear that and miss out on the miracle that God has for you personally. 
Because you got stuck on what everybody else thought. You got stuck on what you're watching. You got stuck on, man, well, this is what I'm listening to. And before you know it, you're missing out on what God wants to do. You're missing out on the miracles. You're missing out on the stories. That can I, because can I tell you something? Jesus wants to do something for your life. He wants to heal you. He wants to restore you. He wants to provide for you. He wants to give you peace. He wants to. There's never a day that Jesus will be like, I don't want to. He can't. He's God. He loves his people. He wants to bless your life. But we can live life and not receive any kind of blessing because we've decided to tune out what he said. We got a different word. Look at the person next to you. I got a different word. I could have, I could have, I could have listened to the doctors all these years when we were struggling to have a kid. And just accepted the defeat. And you know what? Whatever. I guess this is me for the rest of my life. I could have done that. But I live in a different kingdom. I got a different word. My God's different. My God's bigger than the doctor. I got a word that's above an opinion from a doctor. And as you saw, that is a product. And not just what I did, but a product of my belief in God. Some of you will get that later. But it's a product. And that is just an example of what God would do in your life. Because some of you, you are praying for certain things that maybe nobody else knows about, but you do. And they're specific. Because here's the thing about God. What I love about God is that God wants to get specific with you. God, that's why Paul, Paul was very, he was, he emphasized this in Philippians. He says, by prayer and petition. You know what that means? Petition means something specific because we're very good at general prayers. God be with me. For what? What are you going to do? God bless the city. For what? What are you wanting the city to be blessed for? You understand what I'm saying? When you're praying to God, God wants you to be as specific as you, be, you can be. God, I want my son to be healed because this, this, and this. God, I'm believing for a car because this, this, and this. There's a difference when you have a petition. There's a difference in your prayer when you choose to talk to God in specifics because God wants specifics. God doesn't just want to just give me a car. Why? Why? But it's hearing God. When we learn to hear God, it call, it has, there has to be a response to what we hear. There has to be a response that, man, God, I'm hearing your word. I'm listening. I'm reading this book that you've, you've put in my hands. And I'm going to respond. You want things to change? Respond to his word. You want things to change? The, the, the centurion had an encounter with Jesus because he heard and he responded. He heard about Jesus and he spoke to Jesus. He heard about Jesus and he said, hey, can we get this guy to come? Can we get this guy to come heal me? Can we get this guy to come enter my situation? It causes a response. And then the Bible says this. It's very interesting that we can learn from the centurion is that he submitted. He said this in verse 8. So Jesus, oh, right, verse 8. And I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers, and I have authority over my soldiers. I only need to say, go, and they go, or come, or, and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this, they do this. The centurion had an amazing position. He had a position that was elevated in man. But here's the problem. He realized that although I have a position, I need to change my posture. I need to submit. We miss this in the story. You know what he's telling Jesus? That because you have authority, I understand that. But because you are higher, I need to submit to you. Because before you can be over, you need to learn to be under. In other words, the things that you want to be over in your life requires you to be under him. That's why Paul was so empathetic, empathetic about, he was so serious. He said he was always saying in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Under, you know, he was always making sure that people understood that before you can be over something, learn to be under. We live in a society that's having a hard time with submission. 
a society that doesn't know how to submit anymore. We live in a society that wants to do whatever they want, and you don't tell me what to do, and I'm going to do this. I got my free will. Yeah, you have your free will, but also realize that in your free will, there are consequences. There are things that you experience that you don't want to experience, and you do want to experience, but there's, you're going to experience something. And the Bible says that the centurion understood. He had to humble himself and say, hey, you got an authority that I don't have, so I'm submitting myself to you. And because I'm submitting myself to you, I know that I'm going to get my healing for my slave, for my servant. Because I'm submitting myself to you, I'm going to experience. Before you can be over, you have to learn to be under something. Under the authority of Christ, under who Jesus is. Because if I can live under Christ, that's why Jesus said to take up your cross and follow him. To take up your cross, to take up your cross and follow him. When me and you can get to a place where we humble ourselves and God, I'm just going to submit myself to you. I'm not going to submit to my feelings. I'm not going to submit to my opinions. I'm not going to submit to my pride because our pride can get the best of us. Our pride can get us to, say, to, to not submit. Our pride can get us to tune out who God is saying. Our pride can, can get us to a place where we don't change because we don't want anyone to tell us what to change. But can I tell you something? That the best change happens under submission. The, uh, we, had, we were celebrating Pursuit Conference, uh, I want to say two weeks ago. Now having a baby, my time goes, I don't even know anymore. Today's Sunday, right? But, and... We brought a pastor, Pastor Normandy. Me and Pastor Normandy, I've been under Pastor Normandy for 15 years now. I served on him in Dallas. And we've had this relationship. And every time we talk, and even when he was here in Laredo, you know, we, we always make sure to spend time. And he's always still to this point leading me. And I always thank him because he'll call out things in me that he notices not because he hates me, not because he doesn't like me, but because he wants me to be better than I was yesterday. He wants me to change. And then sometimes, it, can I tell you something? Sometimes when people call you out on your stuff, it doesn't feel good, but you need it. You don't like it in the moment. You're like, oh, I, I hate you. Blank, blank, blank in your mind. But you need it. You need it to hear that. You needed someone to tell you that. If you're the type of person that can't take that, then you don't know what it is to submit. And because your lack of submission, there is your lack of miracle. There is your lack of change. Where there is a lack of submission, there is a lack in every area of your life. And the centurion, the Bible says that he comes and he, he recognizes the authority of Jesus Christ. And he says, Lord you have an authority. I'm going to submit to you. I understand submission. I understand authority. I already do it, but you're, on, you're, you're different. You're different, and I got to submit myself to you. I got to submit. The reason, here's the thing. When, you, when we don't understand this subject of submission that I'm talking about, the principle of submission and the principles of authorities. Because here's the thing, when we submit under Jesus, under Christ, he gives us an authority to then live out the life. He gives us an authority to be over the things that are under us. He gives us an authority to live this, this believer's authority that we can walk in certain places and we can speak to mountains and they move and we can pray for the sick and they're healed. And, and we can do all, he gives us that authority, but it starts with us coming under him. And if we don't get this right, if we don't get this right in our prayers, if we don't get this right in our behaviors, then don't question and then don't wonder why your prayers aren't being answered. Don't wonder why there's no victories in your life. Because maybe, just maybe, there is a submission problem and a problem that needs to change. Because can I tell you something? Being under Christ and being submitted to him and his word and every authority that God has given you and me, that is where the blessing lies. That is where the blessing lies. The Bible says this in Luke 9.1. Can you put it up there? 
It says, one, G- one day Jesus called together his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority to cast out all demons and to heal all diseases. To cast out demons and to heal all diseases. Guess how they got their authority? He gave it. And because he gave it, they had it. How did the disciples get it? Jesus gave it. And because he gave it, they had it. Many of us have things in our life that have us. Many of us are having things in our life that are trying to control us, trying to dictate us, trying to, to, to put us in a, in a corner, trying to suppress us from what God, for the freedom that God has for us. Many of us have, but here's the thing. When we submit to God's authority, we carry an authority that begins to overcome all the things that are beneath us. Because here's the thing about the problems in your life, that in, and when it comes to Jesus, they come under you. You are over it. You're over the situations. God's given you an authority that is over, not under. But I can't be over until I'm under him. And when I'm under him, then everything else has to be under me. Am I making sense this morning? Okay, just just making sure. And when we have this kind of authority, can I tell you something? Hell cannot stop it. The devil can't stop it. Your unbelieving friends cannot stop it. The people that are speaking against you cannot stop it because you are submitted to him. You're submitted to him. Jesus gives gives us the greatest example of submitting under God. He said, I only do as my father does. He was fully God, fully man, but he lived a life in submission. And because he lived a life in submission, that's why we read the stories and we like the stories. And we're like, man, I love Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. And I want to experience all the things that Jesus has for me. But if you study his life, he lived a life submitted to Christ. Submitted to Christ, not submitted to a feeling, not submitted to an opinion, not submitted to any kind of emotion that you're carrying. No, no, no. Submitted to Christ. Because here's the thing, church, feelings come and go. You can be, ha- you can be mad right now about what I'm saying, and then you'll be happy when you hit Olive Garden right now. They come and go, but the word of God does not change. We change. Our opinions change. Our emotions change. But the word of God does not change. It doesn't change. And so the Bible says that he begins to submit. He has a situation. Anybody got a dying situation? If you got a dying situation, can I tell you something this morning? Make sure that you are under, you're in alignment with the kingdom, with, with who God is. You're in alignment. And here's the thing. Jesus says in the Bible, I want you to read something. It'll make sense. This is why we follow Jesus and why he's the greatest example. Philippians 2, 5 through 11 says this. Paul says, he writes this. He says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Verse 9. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor, and he gave him the name of all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, our Father, our Father. Jesus, greatest example. You know what he gets? His reward is he is exalted for submitting. I'm not saying that me and you will be Jesus, but can I tell you something? There is a reward in submission. That when even though we're not exalted, we're not God, he exalts us over our situations. Our situations are real, but they don't have us. The problems out there are real, but they don't have us. The people that might be struggling with man, the struggles don't have us. Because we live at a different level. We live submitted. And when I live submitted, God will elevate me. God will put me in a place where I am over everything that's trying to keep me under. I'm over it. The Bible says the centurion receives the miracle. 
The centurion has this moment with Jesus, and he's like, you know what, Jesus, man, you, you, can't, you can't come. I'm, I, you can't come, man, I'm not worthy. Just, just say the word. Just say the word, and if you say it, man, I know he'll be healed. And then what happens? It gets Jesus to turn around. The Bible says that he turns around to the crowd, and he, sets, he lets the crowd know. He says, man, I haven't seen a faith like this in all Israel. It wasn't a faith from a Jewish person. It wasn't a faith. It was a faith from a Roman a soldier, a soldier that lives in a culture that, that doesn't have nothing to do with God. The Bible says that he turned around. He said, I haven't seen a faith like this in all Israel. When me and you respond to God's word and we act to it, it gets his attention. Our faith in him gets his attention. When we put our trust in him, it gets his attention. Church, we need to be a church that gets his attention. We need to be a church that says, God, I put my faith in you. I don't understand this, but God, I trust you. God, I don't see what's going on, but God, your word already showed me that in the end that you have, we have the victory. God, I don't feel it, but God, your word says this. When me and you can get the word in us, the word will go forth in our lives. Church, the word of God is not a suggestion. The word of God is not some suggestion that every morning we're going to preach. And here's my opinion that you could take. No, no, no. The word of God is, the Bible says, a double-edged sword. The word of God is a weapon that you can go against what the enemy is trying to do. The word of God is our guide. That's why the word of God is so emphasized throughout the Bible. Why do you think David, in all his emotions in the book of Psalms, says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. David understood, hey, I got problems. But Lord, I'm going to hide your word in my heart. I'm going to meditate on your word. I'm going to let it be so ingrained in my life that I can't go back. That I can't be depressed. That I can't stay addicted. No, no, your, your word is so ingrained in me. Joshua chapter 1. You know what the blessing was for him? Jesus, God told him, he said, if you meditate in my word and do what it says, you will be blessed. They were about to enter the promised land. But the blessing came in submission. If you submit, you'll be blessed. If the word of God goes forth, you'll be blessed. If you trust in me, you'll be blessed. The centurion not only gets Jesus to turn to the crowd, it turns his life around and his servant's life around. It's a turnaround faith. I'm here to let you know that God wants to do a turnaround faith in you. God wants to turn around your situation. God wants to turn around your heart. God wants to turn around your children. God wants to do something more than you could ever thought or imagine. Do I have people here that believe this morning that God wants to do more? God wants to do more. I pray in Jesus' name that these last couple of months that God would do more, that you would see his hand like never before because me and you decided today, God, I'm going to submit. God, your, worth is, your word is going to go forth in my life. God, everything in this book that you've talked to me about, Lord, I'm, I'm going to apply this. Jesus may not be physically here with us. And he wasn't physically there for his servants. But man, we got a word. He may not be physically there with you in that room, but you got a word. The doctors might be there physically in your face, but you got a word. You got a word. Your job might be crazy and it might be depressing, but man, you got a word. The situations in your life might be impossible, but you got a word. And that's all you need, church. You got a word. And that's all you need is his word to go forth in your life. The centurion was like, hey, you know what I love about the centurion? Even though he didn't grow up Christian and all that stuff, he recognized, Jesus, you don't have to come, but I know that if you say it, it'll happen. I know if you say it. When we have a faith like that, church, 
where God, I know that like you're not physically in my face, but with what you said, I know will happen. You've already had a word. You've already spoken. And because you've spoken it, I know it'll happen. I know it'll happen. Are problems going to come? Yeah, they come. And Jesus himself said that problems would come, but take heart. He said, I have overcome the world. He said, problems are going to come, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I have overcome. So what can we learn about the centurion today? He said, he heard, he submitted, and he received. That's all it is. Human, you know, human beings, we're, we, we, we have this tendency to make things difficult when they're not that difficult. Me and you have a tendency to make the word of God difficult when it's not really that difficult. If you would read his word and do what it says, everything else will fall into place. We sometimes make it hard and it's not that hard. Here's a formula. Hear the word, submit to the word, receive the word. He heard, he submitted, he received the healing. There's a miracle for you this morning for your life. But we can't receive that unless it is through Jesus and Jesus himself. Maybe you're